So, it is my pleasure to introduce Russ Engel, who's going to be talking about exoskeleton stuff, which is way cool. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Do I? I was talking to this one. Okay. Um, so, thanks for having us. Um, Sam Sam told me a little bit about the club and, and, and said you guys were interested in robots and thought you might be interested in hearing about exoskeletons. He sort of sent me an email a couple weeks ago and said, hey, can you come down here and present? Sure, sounds like fun. So we're here. Um, I got a presentation I threw together pretty quickly. I tried to put in videos. We kind of dug through the files today to pull stuff out that might be interesting for you guys to see. Um, a lot of stuff we don't usually show people, some of the background, some of the history, some of the stuff. Um, and uh, we have a lot of videos and slides to go through. I'll try to talk quickly. At any point, if there's questions, feel free to, to, to pipe up and ask. Um, and then at the end of the show, we actually have um, our Hulk exoskeleton here. Sam's going to demo that, and then we have a leg of the exo you see on the screen. Uh, we couldn't bring a whole one; they were all spoken for. Um, so, uh, exobionics. Um, what we're all about is revolutionizing mobility, and we like to make the, the an analogy from the you know the wagon to the car, the bike to the motorcycle, and a set of leg braces to actual robotic um, legs. Um, but we didn't really start there. Um, so, to date, let's see, we've been around since 2005. And to date, we've taken 600,000 steps in exoskeletons. Kind of, that's our, our tracking metric. Um, so, we've been doing this for a while. And really, we, to date, since 2005, we have two products that are out. One is the Hulk exoskeleton, which we have here to show. And the other is the exo. They're both very different um, products. One, the Hulk was our first product. It was geared for uh, military applications, basically for load carriage. So you can put payload on the exo. All the weight goes through the exoskeleton, bypassing the user, um, and goes to the ground. Um, and then our other exo is made for spinal cord injury patients to help them get up and walk again. So kind of on either end of the, uh, the spectrum from ability, really. Um, but I'm going to go back through and kind of give you the history of how how we got to where we are today. So it started actually back in 2004. Uh, well, I think it started earlier than that. 2002 started as a DARPA program at UC Berkeley, and they had the Bleaks exoskeleton. So if you Google Bleaks, you'll find videos of this thing online. And um, it was a really impressive machine. It was the world's first untethered powered exo walking exoskeleton. Um, and I think it's in the Guinness Book of World Records in 2006 or five. I think there's a picture of it in there. I, I have a video of it. Does the audio work? So you can hear the IC engine that's powering it. So it was a hydraulic exoskeleton, uh, powered ankles, knees, hips, and actually powered abduction, all with hydraulic servo valves. Um, Pretty impressive uh, piece of equipment. Um, that entire backpack, though, that you see on the back, is a power supply. <laughs> <laughs> so, at the end of the day, it's what we like to call a self licking ice cream cone. Um, it was really neat and powerful, but it could only power itself. And so, I actually came in and started working on the project right after this video was shot. Um, we were supposed to be bleached too and do the next rep for the for the uh, for DARPA and, and kind of make improvements, make it more of a product. Can you not hear me? Right. Make it more of a product and, and bring it out. Um, so some of my background, I have a, a, a mechanical engineer or an agricultural engineering background actually with a PE mechanical. Um, so I've always liked building things since I was a young kid. And I have an older brother that's a Navy SEAL and we made this deal. He went off to the Naval Academy and he knew he wanted to be a SEAL. I said, all right, I'll go get my engineering degree and I'll figure out ways to make you guys cool stuff. And so when I got the call to say, hey, you want to come work on exoskeletons, I saw the, the video and said, oh, hell yeah, I'm in. Um, it was a perfect thing to, to help with my brother. And there's a huge issue. Um, chronic back injuries in the military is 30, 37%. It's actually the number one reason for people to get medically e from our current conflicts is musculoskeletal injuries. So injuries to the knees and back is the most prevalent injury in the military today. 
So um, started going through that and looking at some of the issues, but the, the one issue we talked about briefly, um, two weeks into the, the project, we realized, we had, one, we had a power problem. Right, the thing, we use 2,500 watts. So how are you gonna make 2,500 watts portable on something that's not an IC engine and something that a soldier is actually gonna wanna wear? And having that relationship with my brother and somebody that's actually gonna be an end user, talking to him, he's like, it's a non-starter. I mean, the thing weighs 130 pounds and can only power itself and it just wasn't gonna work. So that was the first problem we ran into when we got when we got to, uh, to week two. The other problem we had, um, was I got a call from my brother. He actually broke his neck two weeks into the project. So they had this weird uh, series of events where I'm flying across the country. This is actually an image of a CT scan where I'm thinking, okay, we're going to make exoskeletons to help people walk again. Um, he's fine. He totally recovered. He windsurfs all the time, does 26 pull-ups. And the interesting thing was he only lost the use of his arms. So I show up in, in Virginia, and there's my brother. He could walk just fine, but he lost the entire use of his arms. <coughs> Guys in phenomenal shape, Navy SEAL, big arms. He could hardly pick up a pen. And it took him about two and a half years to really rebuild the strength to get the nerves to go back. And it was really my first exposure to um, spinal cord injury and seeing someone actually recover from it, an incomplete injury. Um, and the thing that he was so lucky about was it was an upper body injury and he could do the rehab on his own. So he was able to rehab himself at home. Uh, he basically remodeled his house starting with cabinet knobs and worked his way up and got his strength back to where now you would never know he had an injury. That's actually a picture of him on the Outer Banks windsurfing. Um, so we went back um, to the lab to keep... <laughs> so we went back to the lab to continue working on exoskeletons. We didn't have to solve the, the, the spinal cord injury problem right away, but it started the bug um, in, the, in, the, uh, in the brain. Um, but tackling the power problem, right? So one of the issues was there's people out there with, with prosthetic knees that were walking that are completely unpowered. How are they doing that? You know, so we started looking at their, are there other ways to power, power legged machines um, more efficiently? So we really looked to the, the world of prosthetics and there's actually a picture there. This is actually the picture of our first, uh, we called it Bugly, um, prototype. And it has a, a set of, I don't know if you can see the picture yet. So it's got a set of prosthetic knees that we actually packed into, modified the valve, it had a hydraulic knee, modified the valve, put some sensors in the, in the feet, and we basically had control over the damping on the knees so we could actively damp in stance and allow for free swing. And we were able to carry up to 150 pounds in this device and it, and it felt great. Um, and that was really the start of this, hey, I think we can make really efficient low power exoskeletons. And so our first, after we're going through that prototyping phase, we made this device called Exo Hiker. Exo Hiker, um, again for carrying payload, was built in 2005. No power injection, just active damping at the knees. Um, it weighed 32 pounds, used five watts of power. So we went from 2,500 watts to five watts. So this was a big deal for us and it was, really all in the geometry of the joints and the joint placement and how you how you make a structure that can support weight um, without actually using power. So all of our devices ever since Exo Hiker have used that same um, mechanical geometry that can support a weight without actually using power. Um, right, okay, yeah, I just uh, want some vocabulary clarification. Is it, uh, well, okay, so you're saying it consumes five watts, but there's no power injected. So is it generating its own power from someplace? There? No, no, no. It uses and batteries. We were just doing active damping. So we had okay. two motors on, on valves. So we can control the valving of the knee dampers. Okay. All right. I was going to ask you what active damping is. Okay. So active damping so. the knees. If you look at the gait cycle, the majority of, of the gait cycle, the knee is a damper. Um, you can capture some power out of it, but most of the time it's just a damper. So taking out that load and being able to support the weight. So it wouldn't give you any assistance if you're going upstairs. It wouldn't do anything for you, uh, okay. mostly level ground walking. Um, so we looked at this and, and we had came to that same, that same conclusion. Hey, this is great, but we're not putting any power in. Everyone wants more power, right? So we started looking, okay, well, we're gonna inject power. So the first place we injected power was a, a device called Exo Climber. So we actually made new hydraulic modules on the side that had a larger prime mover motor and we were able to inject power into the knee for the first time. So this would actually help you 
climb stairs, climb hills, and it, it took our power consumption up to 100 watts. Now that all our power consumption numbers are while walking or while climbing, um, back when you're not walking or, or standing still, we're back to just the, the electronic power draw. We're not we're not consuming power. Um, but we had we had two problems with this this machine. Um, we we had them both evaluated by the, by the Army, and the Army's metric for efficiency in, in exoskeletons is metabolic efficiency. So what that is is basically how much energy is a human consuming. And are you more efficient with the exoskeleton than without the exoskeleton? So both of these devices added mass and inertia to the legs. With, while, while they cancel the load you're putting on the back, that extra mass and inertia you're adding to the legs and trying to swing is adding work to the user. It basically feels like heavy boots that you got to walk in. So we increase the heart rate and metabolic cost of the, the wearers. So the Army said, okay, even though it does, yes, it carries and supports the load. It's going to protect the back and knees. It's a non-starter for us because the guy is going to get tired. We said, okay. We went back to the drawing board, and after, I think, 900 different metabolic tests and ways, we, we would try all sorts of different ways to add power to the, the user efficiently. We came up with the, the Hulk exoskeleton. Uh, the Hulk exoskeleton, um, this is our first-gen version, weighed in at 53 pounds, still a 200-pound payload weight, and uses 250 watts at three miles an hour. So um, the interesting thing about the payload weight, you've seen that's been consistent the entire time. Once you go over 200 pounds of payload on a person, we, can't, we can cancel the effects of gravity. We can't get rid of the inertia effects. So you're still massive with this load. So it's kind of part of the training aspect. When someone first gets one of these, you don't feel the actual weight on you. And you go to do a move you would never do with 200 pounds on you. I mean, a good analogy would be take a broomstick, put 200 pounds on that broomstick and stand here. You're not supporting that weight at all. So that's really what the exoskeleton does. But if someone comes up and starts shaking the other side of that 200 pounds, you have to stop the shaking of that 200 pounds. So we can't get rid of the inertial effect. So really the payload, the upper payload limit for these devices is around 200 pounds, depending on the, the user's strength, because they still need their core muscles to react that. But what we did with X, well, or with Hulk is we actually added hip power. So for the first time, we can inject power into the user and help them swing their legs and actually provide stance torque while you're walking, so it's kind of like an ORO. Um, so we could actually power and reduce the metabolic cost for the, uh, the individual wearing it. So this was a big win for us, um, figuring out how to do that efficiently. And I think we have a, a video next. Um, I think Sam posted a video on the website of this for you guys to see. It's This is a video of it out um, in rugged train running around uh, showing what it does. So basically, um, it takes the, the body armor load off of the person, takes the back load. We have attachments where we can hang uh, weights off the fronts. We've made a full length ballistic shield that weighs 130 pounds. We've made um, a set of arms for logistics applications and maintenance applications that we can mount to it. It's just basically a mobile load carriage platform um, that's pretty easy to take off, put on. It's hydraulically powered. Um, still, but we use the hydraulics more like a, a transmission than typical hydraulics. So our, our actual overall efficiency on Hulk from battery to work out is about 40%, which for hydraulics compared to the Bleak's devices is pretty phenomenal. And we're actually working on a DARPA program to even further the efficiency of, of hydraulics for mobile applications. Is that backpack the, just the power supply still? No, the backpack's just weight. So oh, dead weight. Dead weight. Okay. So yeah. it would be supplies. Yeah. So the batter the batteries on Hulk. Well, the new system actually uses. Um, let's see. If, I don't think I have. So uh, we actually have two pictures here. One is the Gen One system, which you see on the left, and the Gen Two system on the right, which is what you'll see here, the ruggedized Hulk. Um, the one on the right is the uh, uh, lift assist um, attachment that we've made for it. But the the batteries are. On the, on the existing Hulk that you'll see now, it has 16 pounds of battery. It's a it's a 2590 standard military lithium um, battery, rechargeable battery. So it's kind of a bummer because it's not the best uh, chemistry. It's not the best energy density. Go ahead. Uh, for the 16 pounds, does that count as part of the payload, or it kind of support that weight? 
it supports that weight. So 200 pounds is pure payload. The device itself now weighs 80 pounds oh. since we've ruggedized it with Lockheed. Um, so 80 pounds and you can put an additional 200 pounds on top of that. So back to that inertia problem, if you put 200 pounds plus 80 pounds, now you're really massive <laughs> walking around with this thing. Um, so it's uh, lighter is always better in exoskeletons, so anything you can do to make things lighter is always better. Go ahead. Uh, for that attachment on the right, uh -huh. uh, does that count as payload? Uh, that does, actually, and it's it's actually a counter counterweight for front load. Um, with exoskeletons um, and with humans, and this kind of goes back to that 200 pound payload capacity limit. Your center of gravity of you and the combined exoskeleton always has to go through your feet. So if you ever seen a, a aliens where it's going to be picking up an alien out here, unless that device she's wearing is really massive, CG has to go through your feet. If you try to pick up something 500 pounds that's out here, you're gonna tip over. So with this device, with the front load, we actually have an active counterweight to counter the weight that you're picking up. So that device weighs 50 pounds, so it allows you to pick up 150 pounds and maintain the CG over the person's uh, footprint. I guess you could do that, or you could wear really long ski shoes or clown shoes. <laughs> that, would, that might help. Um, so that was that was the Hulk. Um, we ended up licensing this technology to Lockheed Martin, and now they're they're in charge of marketing and selling that to the to the military customers. Um, what we did, uh, learned early on is three crazy guys from Berkeley have a really hard time selling anything to the U.S. government. <laughs> um, so it was better to find a partner to help us do that, and they've actually been a great partner and. and, and we learned a lot. We, when we did the original licensing deal with the company, I think we, the company size was, I think there were seven people. And from there, we grew up to um, 20 people. We still do all the development. They basically pay us to do the, all the development for the exoskeleton and they're uh, kind of the front end marketeers of it. Um, so it, it was a, a, a great um, step for our company. We were able to bring in more capital, um, bring in more people and kind of learn some, some good practices on how to build and construct things. So that, so that was helpful. But in parallel to this project, while we were doing Hulk, we were also working on the medical side. So we did a bunch of, um, of early grants um, through NSF, NIH, and um, some, other, um, some other agencies to help uh, make exoskeletons. And this video here, the place is actually, you'll notice it looks very similar to an exo hiker, but this is actually the first time this is the first time anyone ever walked in a this guy's um, paralyzed and he's walking in an exoskeleton it's a retrofitted version of a Hulk um, to do more of a position based control model versus the, the Hulk is a all force based controller um, so it's more like power steering for your legs versus <laughs> Our exo and medical exo are more of a position based, but we're actually prescribing a, a prescribed key to ensure that the, the correct step is taken every time. So, you see he's kind of hanging from the ceiling at this point. It, it's, um, this is to show you the progression. So, really, we, we, we never show anyone these videos. So you guys are kind of seeing, you know, the early stages of a. a you know, cobble together prototype, let's throw something together, see if we can make it work. Um, you know, just quick and dirty, get something together. Uh, and this was in 2009, to give you a time frame. How is the leg being actuated here? It's hydraulic. But is he doing something to actuate it? No, the, the, um, the one of the guys standing behind him is actually triggering and instigating okay. a, a gate step. So there you see I take a uh, step, really at that point. So uh, that was the very first time we put somebody, there was a step. And this next video is actually, as part of the grant, we were doing some, this next video is us uh, doing some uh, uh, video capture out in, um, out in was that, University of Virginia, uh, the next so walking. So it was actually taking nicer steps at that point. Um, and you can see the crutches and the markers. Um, and they, we, we did a quick, those little vectors coming out of the ground, those are actually force vectors from the, the, the these little arrows here from the load cell in the ground. Is this a simulation or is this a tracking? That's tracking. That's actually tracking that video. So after we went through this and we kind of, uh, historically the way we attack, attack these problems is 
build something as quick as you can and get somebody in it because what you're going to learn by doing that is huge um, versus trying to design and get it right the first time. You'll never get it right. And the, the, one of the benefits we have is we put people in our devices and they give you instant feedback. So you might think you have the best idea in the world and then you design that quick and dirty prototype and you throw it on somebody and in 10 seconds you're like, this isn't going to work. And, and you move on. So that's the efficient way to do it. Um, this next video is actually our, our second gen prototype which we actually switched to electric actuation. So, and there's, you'll notice there's nobody in it and we're just showing how it walks. So there's a big difference that the Hulk exoskeleton actually can't do this. It can't walk itself without somebody in it. Um, go ahead. Uh, so this guy, uh, this one doesn't need a, a person to uh, to balance, so it, it can balance itself. Correct. That, that that's 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 exactly right. So what we what was the term we used in one of our videos? Mantonomous systems. They're not autonomous. Um, we basically use the strength and smarts of a, a, of a robot to move things, but we, we still rely on the, the best balancing computer we know of on the planet, that is the human brain, to activate the balance. And that holds true for Hulk and for EXO. Um, and this actually turns out to be a very important uh, feature of EXO, especially in the case of spinal cord injury, is you want the, the patient actively involved in the, in the process of walking and balancing so that the the signals um, from the brain are actually heading down the spinal cord. At the same time, they're getting walked by the robot, and so the signals from the legs being walked are actually going back up the spinal cord. And according to the therapist, that's an important part of the recovery process, especially for incomplete spinal so this, cord. So this is not hanging on a string? No, no, he's he was just bal stabilizing it. And oh, I see, he's bal the person's The person's balancing it, yeah. yeah. But it's able to walk itself and do that. It, so the basic design goal is to have this exo walk the correct trajectory, walking trajectory, with whatever the, the patient's in it. Um, so whether they have zero function or some function in case of, uh, say, stroke, for instance, there might be some uh, motor function there, and we're going to try to uh, prescribe them the correct gait. What kind of freedoms do you have in the various joints, then? Just pretty simple hinge joints, or the more complex for the, for the hip? very simple hinge joints. So you can do that um, for the the knee, and especially in the sagittal plane, you can use just a simple mm -hmm. hinge joint. Um, and I think the way we get away with that is we're not rigidly coupled to the human. So the human is uh, joints aren't perfect hinge joints. And so since we had that uh, a little bit of decoupling, we are, we are allowed some slop in there to account for the misalignment of the joints. But it's still critical to size the exo uh, for each individual, um, and at, you notice that more and more as you get into <coughs> higher range of motions. Um, so, say Sam gets Sam's. How tall are you? Six foot four. Six five. Six, five. If I try to get in the device the size for him, I might be able to stand in it and walk it a little bit. But if I tried to do a high angle move on my knee, the, the joint misalignment would get painful, and, and it would just basically stop me from moving. So you, you actually have the weight on the foot part. Uh huh. And then just wings or something at various points, so you're not actually clamping to the leg. Is that yeah? We have um, straps. So, straps. Um, would you repeat the question? Okay. Yeah. So the question was, um, we stand on the feet, so the user stands on the exo feet, and then what are the other connection points, basically, to the leg? So where we connect to the user on the Hulk is we stand on the feet. Um, we connect. We have a thigh strap, and that's. On the Hulk, it's mainly to keep the, the leg in plane because it has a lot of degrees of freedom that aren't powered and they can go out of plane. And so more, it's more just to keep the leg close to you. Um, and then we attach the torso. On the EXO product, um, we actually have to keep the user from falling out of the device. So that very first video you saw, the first thing we learned when we tried to um, <coughs> take a, a paralyzed person up in an EXO was he wanted to fall right out of the bottom. And so we actually added shank straps and thigh straps and a better torso on this to give them um, torso support, especially depending on their injury level. If they're very high level, they need that torso support to keep them from folding over. Um, so we attach rigidly, I'd say, at the torso and more rigidly on the exo and less rigidly on the whole. That better right. oh, So the second gen prototype. 
So this is our electric version of that XO. Um, I guess it's the same when you saw it to actually with a, a user in it going through some of the motions. So you can see some of the strapping down at the shanks um, and at the thighs and then the torso. There's coming out of a, a sit to stand mode. So again, this XO is adjustable. It's made for a, a rehab environment to test different users. Um, we can do it, we can actually instigate gait in several ways. You can have the physical therapist instigate gait by saying step left, step right, step left, step right. Uh, you can adjust the parameters of the gait based on the individual. And then we also have an HMI mode where we have smart crutches that have sensors built in and basically uh, measure the gesture and the, uh, the stability pyramid that, or triangle that the user makes and figures out when it's time to take a safe step. And so those are kind of the modes we can walk in. You can walk with a walker, you can walk with crutches, um, you can walk on parallel bars. So this is our second gen prototype, our first electric XO. And then we basically, we came out with that, I'd say last October, we actually came out public with, with it. And then since then, we've been working on um, a design that's uh, built to the standards to be able to sell as a product. What's HMI? Uh, human machine, human machine interface. interface. So these are various rehab centers um, testing the how do, how do you prevent um, like overextension, like accidentally having the user end up in a split or something dangerous? Um, so we have uh, hard stops. And we've, we've tried to size the EXO so that it can't, on uh, both the Hulk actually and the, the EXO, that its range of motion is constrained to the human range of motion. Um, so in the case of the Hulk, we actually can prevent uh, rolling an ankle, twisting a knee, hurting a hip. And, and it's a, it actually has a neat design where it, it, in flexion it'll actually run out of range of motion so it can't fold you backwards if it, you have, for some reason, had a catastrophic runaway. And the other way, due to the, the geometry, the linkage, it actually runs out of torque. So it can't fold you in half. So that actually works out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was actually the the iron was the Iron Man two where it has the guy in there and he twists in half and oh he was okay. Yeah, we had this issue. Actually, the first leaks prototype, the way the servo valves work. Um, I don't know if anyone here has played with hydraulic servo valves, um, but they the 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 dissymmetry of the the valves. We had one valve this way and the other valve was mirrored. So there were times where we'd lose power in those legs. And due to that, the flipping of the valves, the one leg would go out and the other leg would go back. And so if the person would be walking, the computer would lose power, the person would just go into the splits and hang from the tether over the treadmill. So yeah. Do you have to design a, revert, a, a mirror image uh, valve for the other legs? Well, well, yeah, we got away from that, from that design entirely. So now we have symmetric valving. Actually, our valves now, uh, all of the, uh, the Hulk side, the, all of our hydraulic ones are completely back drivable. So if you lose power, you can actually back drive the entire powertrain, uh, which is an important factor. If, if for some reason not, you lost power, you don't freeze up and eat it. You can recover. You just feel like you have heavy legs again. So you wouldn't want to walk around with it unpowered for for a while. Um, so here's kind of uh, some of the specs on it. Um, it's not that interesting. This was more for a market. You guys know about this. Um, Actually, here's a video of one of our ambassadors. My name is Jason Beeser, I'm years old from Discovery Bay, California. Before my accident, I was a police officer, and I worked for the cities of Oakland and Antioch. On October 2008, me and a couple of friends were out riding on motorcycles in the Oakland Hills. It was about 11.30 in the morning. I was going into a really tight turn, and somehow, myself and a car collided head on and put me into the windshield and up over the car. The injuries that I sustained was a complete transection of my back. Um, my spinal cord looked like that. And a fractured neck, a swollen brain, collapsed lung. I remember seeing my mom uh, around the hospital bed and uh, telling me the doctor's gonna come in and tell me what's wrong with me. Because uh, I asked her, what's wrong with me? Why can't I, why can't I move my legs? And I already knew, um, but I needed that confirmation. Uh, I needed someone to tell me uh, that I was paralyzed. Since the very beginning, from the first moment I knew that I couldn't walk, I never gave up hope that there wouldn't be a day that I would walk again. 
I keep that in the, the front of my mind all the time, and it leads me uh, to hit my goals. I first got involved with exobionics about a year ago. It's really, the words are indescribable, exhilarating, liberating, um, to be liberated from my wheelchair, to be able to stand up and move. Today it was special for me and my daughter because she's never seen me walk in the exo. It was amazing. I finally got to see him walk after three years. And it felt wonderful to feel tiny next to him. Yeah, I've already envisioned myself in the exo walking around the lake with my family. I've envisioned me in the house in the exo, um, reaching in the top cabinet and grabbing something from near the top shelf that I couldn't reach in the wheelchair. I think about that stuff and it's really cool. It's just the things that people are going to be able to do. Because there are some people that have lost hope. And the EXO really brings that back. You know, to think about those uh, special things like walking at your daughter's wedding or standing up at your own. A device like this symbolizes hope that one day they're going to rise from their chair and they're going to be able to walk. No, I mean we're we're staying focused to the devices on on this scale, really that that 200 that sub 200 pound payload um, type of applications. Um, I'd say the stuff we're looking at um, with DARPA is how to be more efficient across the board with actuation and 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 figuring out ways to make hydraulics more efficient. Tra traditionally, hydraulics are not used in robotics. Does anyone else here have a hydraulically powered robot? And stuff with like the um, kids at the first robotics, uh -huh. but the, ro the hydraulics is always like you stay away from it as much as possible because it just drops too much power. Yeah, exactly. So we're we're working on ways to solve that power problem because the reality is if you can make it work and you can make it efficient, the power density you get at the joints um, is phenomenal. I mean, you'll you'll look at um, Hulk when we pull it out. The the size of the actual cylinder and actuator is is great versus slapping a big electric motor and harmonic drive out of the joints. So. The idea with EXOS is to keep all your, your um, you know, extended inertia down and consolidate it to a back, and hydraulics work well, really well for that. Um, so that's kind of the goal there with DARPA. Um, and then just making things better, faster, more agile. Go ahead. Uh, have you considered uh, like a twin scale of skeletons that uh, like cover the whole body? No. <laughs> oh, the question was, have you considered a full-scale exoskeleton that covers the entire body? Great question. Like Iron Man? Yeah. Yeah. Until we figure out the power supply <laughs> to run those, we're going to stick, stick away from those. But it, it's, uh, the, they want more protection, um, and so the, you'll see more coverage on the exos, but again, it's the swinging of mass and inertias of those types of exoskeletons get really difficult. What sensors are you use? Any sensors? Sensors. Um, which device? Maybe you should start getting in Hulk so we can talk about that as, as you come up here. Actually, I'll grab I'll grab one of the exoskeleton legs. Um, well, Sam getting in Hulk. So this is this is the Hulk. Um, this is an exo left exo leg that you guys can pass around or come take a look at. Um, so we power the hips and the knees. It's uh, electrically actuated. Um, we have a, a ball screw drive down to the legs that actually powers, so you can hear the noise of the ball screw. Um, sprung ankles. Uh, we have uh, locked out all, most all other degrees of freedom on these exos. Um, so most of the, the movements in the sagittal plane, we do have mechanisms to unlock certain joints, um, and this is important for getting in and out of the exoskeleton. But when you're in walking mode, you actually want it pretty locked and rigid, um, but 
that's kind of it. We actually have a brake on the knee to, to add to the torque. That's one of the beauties about hydraulics. Um, to provide huge braking torque, all you have to do is close a valve. On electric actuation, you actually have to power a brake. So there's all these trade-offs on, on different types of actuation schemes. Yeah? Uh, yeah, so the sensor suite on here. So this leg would have uh, encoders on the knees, position sensors on the joints, um, force sensors, so we know the actual joint torques. Um, we actually do have a gyro suite. So we have a series of sensors that lets us know basically where the robot is in space. So we know the orientation of the EXO um, through some IMUs and gy ray gyros in the back and can calculate where it is and then um, do the correct control based on that. Uh, we also have pressure sensors in the feet. We actually make our own sensors now for the feet. It turns out making sensors that last a long time in shoes is very difficult. Uh, the Hulk exoskeleton and foot sensors after going through, um, we tried FSRs for a while but they wore out. And we ended up going with pressure sensors and we just filled tubes with oil and then used uh, a pressure sensor, a simple $30 pressure sensor that actually me measured the pressure in the tube. And that was enough to uh, last for years, actually. So this is the Hulk exoskeleton. Um, let's put this one down. So uh, Sam's at the upper range of who will fit in the exoskeleton, <laughs> but it is, <laughs> it is adjustable. Uh, we have adjustability built in to the shoulder straps, to the torso, to the thigh, and to the shank. Um, the question's about where do we attach to the individual. We have uh, attachment points at the foot. Obviously, we grab the foot and the binding, thigh straps, a waist strap, and then shoulder straps. Um, if you turn around, I'll show them what's on the back. On the back, we have um, our batteries. So each one of these battery packs holds three 2590 batteries. We have our uh, electronics computer controller, and down in each one of these is our um, actuator package. We have an uh, electric motor in here that powers the hydraulics, that powers both the hip and the knee. So when Sam picks his foot up, um, it puts in a hip torque and actually feels like someone's grabbing the bottom of your foot and helping pick your foot up. Yeah, oh yeah, I'll go grab the pack. So you can take any uh, backpack that you want. So all we've done, this is a standard military rucksack, and all we've done is added these ropes uh, to the rucksack, and they actually clip in to the uh, back here. actually finds the center of gravity. Oh, he does. He, he does. does. Yeah. Actually, though, if he bends over, go ahead and try to touch your toes. <laughs> yeah. So as soon as he does that, he's actually getting hip torque. The machine, the machine basically wants to depower itself when you're close to your neutral CG, so we're not burning a bunch of power. But if he gets into a mode where he, we think he needs torque, it'll add torque to him. Um, what he's playing with there is you can turn the machine on, you can turn the machine off, and then you have to set how much payload you have or you're, you're carrying. Um, it's no, We don't have any sensors to know the payload. You can actually clip in payload up here on the front, so typically the body armor would clip in up front, and that could weigh up to 50 pounds. Um, and then the backpack could weigh 150 pounds. And you basically set the machine to shadow, or basically be able to lift that entire payload so that it shadows the user. If Sam tried to squat with no weight on and sat there in a squat and then he actually rails the payload up to 200 pounds, it's going to try to lift him up with 200 pounds, which would be extremely uncomfortable. So you want to set that payload and, and have it matched to you so it follows you like a shadow. How much payload do you have now? I'm guessing 80 pounds. Yeah. 60 something. Not too much. We still have carried in here. 
A single value. How fast can you uh, walk or run? So the the top speed that we can really assist you at is about seven miles an hour. Um, you can overspeed it and go up to ten. Um, but uh, I'll caution you: uh, running at ten miles an hour with two hundred pounds on, <laughs> you need to be looking for where you're going to stop. <laughs> <laughs> Took him four up to take you home then? Not yet. <laughs> Carry the car home. And I mean, that's the thing this can't do is it can't tell Sam what to do. Whatever he does, if he picks his foot up fast, it's going to react to that. It's going to react to whatever he's doing. It does. It is smart enough to know consistency and recognize patterns. And as Sam starts walking, if he starts getting into a really consistent pattern, it's going to start putting more and more power into Sam. Um, what we found is you want to dial the power back especially in mode, like say you're walking on rocks or some uneven terrain, you want to um, basically make the machine very dull. And then as you start walking and getting very consistent, then we can start ramping more and more power into the person. What, what sort of longevity? I mean, how long will it operate for? This one, uh, on this set of batteries, will go for about 20 kilometers. So. Is this an actual product? More? Is it used somewhere? Yeah, this one's actually there's there's twelve of these on the there's twelve of these on the planet, and right now they're in testing with the army. Where's the power injected versus the power that he develops for various? So he gets power injected at the hip and the knee only in the sagittal plane. How, how much? How much? Two hundred fifty watts. Compared to his. Uh, exertion of how many watts maybe? Yeah, so <laughs> we can reduce his metabolic cost by, let's say, um, around 9-10%. Oh, okay. Is that relative to him working without a load or carrying the equivalent load? Carrying the equivalent load, yeah. Because, right, he still has to manage the inertia of the load. So he's still working. I mean, the actually, the, the, the best exoskeletons we have right now are your car. Right? You get in your car, you put an input in at the steering, you, you put an input in with the throttle, and that exoskeleton mm -hmm. takes you around with very little input effort. Um, with this one, Sam still has to manage balance and stability, so he still has to work. So it's it's not like he's getting a free ride. He's just not feeling the payload go through his his structure, and he's getting the assist, the, uh, basically the power assist. He's below parity then. Yeah. Okay. Work being done to get rid of that hissing noise? The, the noise? Yeah, we actually, this one's much quieter than the, the first gen, but we're constantly working on it. The thing we noticed, though, the first time we went to a trade show with the new version, trade shows, if anyone's been there, it's a little bit, there's a little bit of a hum, a little bit of a noise at the trade show, and we were walking around and people were asking what it does. And the, early on when they made a lot of noise, they all knew it was a robot, but it was quiet enough to where they didn't notice the, uh, notice the noise and didn't think it did anything. How, how do you prevent him from twisting it? How do you, how do you prevent twisting your ankle? Uh, the range of motion of the ankle is has hard stops that won't let him fully roll his ankle over, forward, back, side to side. What is the Army going to do with a man in something like this? Right now, the, the, the idea is probably more maintenance and logistical applications. Or is it going to be the entry point? So not, not anyone out on the front line of the 11 Bravos out there, but someone in the back end, uh, you know, working on ships, moving equipment, basically adding to that their capabilities. Price tag? Um, unknown. This one's Lockheed. Our current EXO product uh, is $130,000 for reference. Do you have any energy recapture? Or uh, we can if you're going downhill for a long time. We can actually start recouping some energy, but the interest step energy recovery is really hard to do. By the time you turn the electronics on to try to capture the energy back, and it ends up being a wash. Uh, go ahead. How much uh, training does it take to use one of these things? How much training does it take to use it? Great question. Um, about three to four days. Uh, what we found is that as we've added more and more power to the exoskeleton, the training curve um, goes up. Uh, the ideal training situation is have someone get in it for the first time for about 15 minutes on the first day and then get out of it and sleep on it. And the, uh, uh, a modest, you, you go and you sleep on it and your brain replays those activities of the day and you learn it overnight. And then um, you have to get used to how the machine's gonna work with you and how to manage that inertia 
when you don't feel it. That's really the, the, the training group. Go ahead. Uh, when you're going down here, how do you uh, like, uh, prevent the initial problem and uh, keep you from talking to the nervous? It's practice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it looks like you do a lot. Go ahead. Face uh, this. Uh, will there be like different variants for each branch? Okay, so the question is, will there be different variants for each branch of the military? I think it's early days. We basically built these devices to get out in the hands of, of the uh, soldiers to say, here's the technology, this is the state of the technology, how do you guys want to use it? So we've, we've tried everything from, um, you know, uh, our obviously, uh, ruck marching to maintenance to logistics, all these different applications, trying to see where is that entry port, how do people want to use it, um, and, and trying to show them what the state of the current state of the art is. And uh, my second question is, uh, won't this result, like, if, if it feeds too much, will it result in uh, soldiers not exercising and they might get up? Yeah. So the question is, is Sam going to get fat from wearing the EXO? <laughs> um, this will look like good. <laughs> the answer is no, right? So the EXO is reducing his metabolic costs by about 9%. The real benefit is the reduction of load going through his, his structure. So he's still working. He's still maneuvering that inertia and balancing that load. What it's going to allow him to do is to go farther, faster, and when he gets to wherever he's going and takes the exoskeleton off, He's going to be. Uh, he's going to feel a lot better. So does he get tired when he's in there? Uh, less without tired practice. than he would without it. <laughs> less tired. Less tired. Yes. Right. So if a paralyzed person uses this, will he eventually able to run the car? To drive a car. Um, so first, the paralyzed person would use our EXO, the, the electric EXO. Um, well, the rest of it, not just that. Um, <laughs> and. Um, Will they be able to drive a car? Right now, uh, a paralyzed person uses hand controls to drive a car. So the idea is eventually when we go to a, a personal type of EXO for SCI patients to make it custom fit to the individual, get rid of the adjustments, which adds bulk, to where we can get it small enough to where they can actually sit in the car so with it on. the train signal, stepping on the gas and Oh, they use hand controls. Um, they put controls on the steering wheel. Yeah. I don't think we... we we wouldn't want to trust the X yet for pushing the throttle. We thought Toyota had a problem with the Prius. <laughs> what is the target price on these eventually? Oh, I, I don't know on this one what the price is. I mean, obviously cheaper is better. Um, and it's going to, I mean, it's going to really, the price is going to depend on a couple things. It's going to depend on quantity and then uh, requirements, what it's, what it's being designed for. Do you have a goal for the price? No, not on this one. Have you done any research so into you other industry? To design it for somebody that's handicapped. You couldn't just put it on any handicapped person. Oh no, our current exo we can. It, it's it's so adjustable. It doesn't have to be. Uh, how about the height and uh, weight? Of it's adjustable from five five two to six two, I believe, on the exo side. Yeah. What are the tricks for making hydraulics efficient? Uh -huh. um, I don't know if we have this much time. Uh, so um, getting rid of valve losses, I think, is a good way to sum it up. Um, right? Traditional hydraulics, you have a prime mover. You're making a lot of uh, pressure, and then you throttle that pressure into your actuator. And just the, the, the process of throttling is just burning energy. So you want to remove all those throttling um, events if you can. So um, the a way to think about how we use hydraulics in Hulk is purely as a transmission ratio. So we actually have a, a direct prime mover running a pump running a going straight to a cylinder. So there's no valve in it at all. So it's a variable speed pump or a variable displacement? It's not variable speed. It's, it's a fixed displacement pump. So we can run that motor at any speed we want, create any pressure or flow that we want, um, and create the output that we want without a valve. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what's the feedback system to the user? The feedback system to the user, um, they actually still have inner ear functions, so they're balancing based on where the inner ear and it's in training. And they also have crutches. So the, the feedback they get in their hands from crutches is allowing them to balance. Yeah.
Shoot, go over there. How much difference is there between your natural gait and when you're wearing this? Like, since there's, since there's um, platforms that your feet go on, it could be a bit thicker than your normal feet, and your gait might be, your feet might be close together when you're normally walking. Would you have the purpose there's, of the there's of the part? Yeah, there's definitely an exo gait that you learn. Um, and the yeah. real the real crux of the issue is not the foot thickness, it's the oh, fact that we're not powering the ankle. So if you look at the joint so torques on normal top. human walking, most of your yeah. forward well, no, propulsion no. comes from your ankle. There's so right at toe off, that's why your calf muscles are so big. Fine. They're actually pushing you off at toe off, and that's where most of your propulsion force. We don't have active ankles on the exo because we don't want to pay the inertial penalty, penalty to swing that inertia down at the ankle. Um, so we actually input most of your walking torque at your hips. So I think that causes most of the, what we call the exo gait. So it's more of a straight-legged gait than you would do without the exo. Yeah. Sure, I mean, it could carry anything you want to mount to it. Um, we've mounted uh, arms um, for industrial applications. Uh, I mean, Right, the thing you want to do with an exo is you want to do an impossible demo, right? If you're going to put this thing on, you want to know that you can do something that's impossible. Well, an impossible thing is carrying 200 pounds for 20 kilometers. For most people, that's impossible. Yeah. Um, another thing that's impossible is actually holding 30 pounds like this for 30 minutes, right? That's an impossible demo. So we add an arm to the exoskeleton and allow you to carry a heavy industrial tool or some sort of grinder. All of a sudden, you've increased someone's productivity five to one, and that's a huge win. Um, so, so those are some of the things you can now do. But it, basically anything you want to put on it, it goes by the user and goes to the ground. How high can you jump? <laughs> <laughs> so we get, asked that, we get asked that question all the time. And the, the, up to the, pounds. Yeah. the important part is how high can you, uh, how far can you jump? Um, we can't actually accelerate the person fast enough to jump. There's a lot of speed involved in that. Um, but we can actually jump down from from three, four feet and protect the person from that landing. Um, one of the questions everyone wants to do is, I want to jump a house. Well, you have to realize, um, we, if we made an XO that actually allowed you to jump a house, um, we would get you to the top of the roof, but when you got there, you, weren't, you wouldn't be very happy because both your legs would be broken and you, um, if, I can't tell you what your back would do, but the acceleration required to accelerate you, you still have your same leg range of motion. Um, so the best we could do would be like the world's best athlete, right? But you still have, you're, there's still a human in the thing, so we can't accelerate them that quickly. Sam, did your butt get hot there? No. <laughs> with, with body armor, some heat, it does there's get some hot. Awesome, there's some huge heat sinks back there. Yeah, well, the one thing you'll notice, though, you guys can come up and take a look at it. They're, uh, they're ice cold right now. And you don't, you, the, the thing you know, is there's, he's not doing anything, right? There's no, there's no power being used right now. So I could put all my weight on Sam's leg and he doesn't feel any of that weight that goes all the way down through him. And that happens up here. But right now, the, the only power that's being drawn is just the sensors and computers on standby. But as soon as he picks his leg up and you hear the actual pump move, then we're actually burning real power. So that's, that's uh, the key to the efficiency. So you know, for industrial applications or for doing things like this, you could do this for a week and not run through the batteries. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, how, if you uh, use it on full power, how long is the battery last? Uh, 20 kilometers. So we rate it, that's on flat ground. Obviously, if you're going up a hill, that's going to be derated. If you're going down a hill, we'll get a little bit more out of it. Um, but it's a distance rated spec because it's activity based. If you're not moving, you're not moving power. Go ahead. What kind of pressures? Pressures, um, I think the max pressure we probably ever get to is around 3,500 psi. Have there been, you've done any studies on just operator fatigue? If somebody actually walked 20 kilometers with that unusual gait, does that actually cause fatigue? Yeah, we do lots of um, biomechanical studies and evaluations, and that's what we're doing with the Army. Is um, uh, We've noticed d different people um, react differently to the exoskeleton. Um, some people are good users, some people are not good users. And we're trying to quantify what's the difference um, and, and what's the training curve and how to improve training and 
So yeah, we do a lot of those studies. Yeah. You said harmonic drive at one point. What's a harmonic drive? A harmonic drive. Uh, anyone else hear harmonic drives? I explain. <coughs> it's a singular very high ratio uh, gear set. It uses a uh, pair of gears, one inside the other, a very slight difference between the teeth, depending on how you deal with that. You get 100 to 1 or 200 to 1 ratio on a single uh, pair of gear teeth. Yeah. So you basically use a flexible shell. You have a slight mismatch in the number of teeth. Um, so you have 100 teeth on one and 98 teeth on the other one. And it's an elliptical gear set, so it basically indexes a tooth every time you go around. So it's a way to get a really high gear ratio in one step. Uh, so I see that there's no, like, like a light thing, there's nothing on the Yeah. So is there an attachment for Yeah, we have attachments that clip in on the back. So if he turns around, um, we've, uh, there's attachments that can clip in up here and then back here in the back with these quick release pins. Um, we've done anything from the front load attachments to arms to, um, we actually out here at the NASA Dart Center, um, they do, the Santa Clara Fire Department does a lot of disaster recovery training. We've been out there with the fire departments trying to figure out how an exoskeleton could use, be used for first responders, carrying hoses, doing casualty evacs, um, you know, using your, we basically a mobile power source, so you could use it to, to carry jaws of life or whatever you want. And um, when it starts to become really important is when you lose um, roads. Right, that's where exos become really valuable. If you have a road, use a car or use a truck. If you don't have a, a road or you have rubble, you need an exoskeleton to get through it. And uh, my other question is, can you do a push-up? It depends on how strong Sam is. I saw that he has the push-up app on his phone, so probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you say that you have just one motor and pump to run both the hip and the knee? So you're Correct. two independent motions out of one motor? Yeah, that's a very good observation. Well, yes. One motor per side. One motor per yeah. side. Yeah. yeah, so how are you still getting two independent motions out of one pump? Um, we do, it's more of a, uh, a good way to think about it is torque splitting. So we can split the torque and you know the human um, squat and coming out of a stair and step, the basically the geometry of the actuators are sized so that the, 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 they're the proportion of the actuators allow for us to power both actuators at the same time with the same amount of pressure and actuate both when we need to. There's a ratio between a, tra a transfer a case ratio? Yeah. yeah, well, it's variable coming out of the squat. So, yeah, mm. but we basically torque blend between the uh, the hip and the knee. Yeah. So it sounds like they're actually not really independent then? They're not really independent. Uh, well, they're independent one way. We can actually control through a valve. The, uh, the knee, independent of the hip. And so one way we're independent, one way we're a totally fixed ratio. But that ratio is driven by geometry and standard human motions. And so we kind of said, all right, if we do this and fix this ratio, will it work? And it was one of those things where we, it worked. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, does the unit also have the in terms of maintaining your balance, let's say you said in a rocky environment, if you swing too much, your center of gravity might be too far forward or too much back forward. Yeah. This is doing correction. For so the, que the question was, will it help you uh, with your center of gravity? Um, we basically have the, the hip actuators turn off when, you're, when your CD is close to vertical. But if Sam bends forward and goes to touch his toes, they'll actually engage and they'll pull them back up. So <laughs> there's a range there where we, we want to turn everything off, but we'll actually refire it if you get out of whack too far. Yeah. So that means if I jumped on this back right now, it'll generally correct? Well, no, because we can't actually sense that the weight changed. He has to manually input that. Let's try it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have you thought about putting giant magnets on the feet and then walking up the side of a building? Um, that would be awesome. How? <laughs> no, we have not. <laughs> yes. Uh, kind of an obvious next thing is that if you looked at uh, at bounce gates at all. I have a pair of them. Okay. Yeah. That's actually, the, so the, go back to the, we can't, you know, do the, uh, the uh, road runner on the human legs because that's going to hurt. Um, so you're like, okay, well, how you tackle the problem? 
the one thing you can do is increase stride length. Go ahead. Uh, how long does how long does it last when it's off? When it's off a cord, it would last forever. Um, it would be plugged into the wall. Well, I'm saying uh, I'm saying that it doesn't have a cord. It doesn't have a cord. It runs on batteries. So right now it's running on the standard military batteries, and with this with this power configuration, it'll last for about 20 kilometers. Uh, and that's uh, about how much time. Uh, it's not so that's the tricky part. It's distance. It's activity based. It's not uh, a time based. So doing something like this, Sam walking around this room, it'll last for five days. If he actually put on the rucksack and we told him to go walk to South San Jose, he's going to get right past the end and run out of power. It's at 20 kilometers. I don't know. He can go 20 kilometers and then he'll run out of power. <laughs> <laughs> Will Sam get tired by then? Uh, he'll be less tired than he would have if he did not have to use it. <laughs> but he would be tired. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, microcontroller. We have a, uh, it's, uh, so I have a mechanical engineering background, so <laughs> I, I apologize in advance. Um, so there's a, a TI DSP on the back. That's running the the entire thing with the FPGA back there. Um, somebody asked me today how many lines of code there were, and I said I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, you said that um, each suit really needs to be uh, customized for each individual. Uh, I, I guess there are different uh, sizes and all that stuff. But for like a larger organization like the military. I would think that they would prefer it if one suit could be used by multiple people. So is there a way that um, you can modify it easily? So yeah, so um, the question is, do you need to customize the suit for each individual? Uh, the answer is that this is adjustable. You just have to have it properly sized for each individual. But this one's adjustable from 5 foot 4 to 6 4, or however tall Sam is. Um, so we have these adjustments down here on the shank. On the thigh um, is actually toolless. You open a clasp and rotate. And then on the back, we can adjust the height of the torso. Um, so those are the, basically the three adjustments we made. Any alarms go off if he does something, something wrong and then gets in trouble? Or um, that, Actually, that was some of the stuff we learned from, um, from Lockheed, having Lockheed on board, was putting in uh, built-in bit testing. So when the device fires up, it runs through and checks all the sensor states. Make sure everything's running. It'll give you error flags, and so it, it's. Uh, we learned a lot um, working with them on how to make a robust. Uh, but not under robust. dynamic motion. If he leans over the wrong way. Oh, it'll like tell him if there's an error. If he loses the sensor, it, it, I have to check. He has to oh, check. It we don't beat. Me. Oh, okay. Are there one we can beat? Yeah. Uh, what kind of computers are you using in here? Uh, it just has a DSP a, on oh, in the back. Oh, just DSP. Yeah. No SPC. DC one hundred four. Nope. Nothing that complex. No. It's, it's not that hard. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we've talked about it. Um, and it's, I think it's really going to happen um, as we transition from a device geared towards rehab and towards that of device geared for individuals for personal use. And those devices will be more customized for the individual. So we're, we're aiming for 2014 for those devices to come out. Um, so probably then there will be some applications there to make things smaller. Is it hardened for different environmental and weather conditions? This one is actually. What's not shown, because um, it makes it not look as cool, is there's a set of pants that go on the EXO. So there's a ring right here, um, a ceiling ring, and then there's a ceiling ring down at the bottom. <laughs> so you basically cover the, the entire leg in a waterproof um, uh, camouflage pouch and then the back isn't entirely waterproof so you can submerse it up to uh, over a meter like Wallace and Gromit yeah wrong trousers wrong trousers <laughs> yeah <laughs> I mean has it been with the military having to, to swim a river or something wearing that would that be feasible oh no I doubt it <laughs> yeah you can sink yeah. We're not. We're not there yet. Waiting a stream or something would be feasible, yeah. sort of. Yeah. yeah, there was actually a group in Florida working on a swimming exo for a yeah. while, yeah. and they, and I talked to the guy that actually put it on and swam with it, <laughs> and had to be hair raising. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is there, uh, like right now, although he's not walking around that much, is there <coughs> someone close to him, or 
it's completely it's no different from him standing without the unit. It's no different than him standing without the unit. He's got a place to rest. He's got a rest. <laughs> it's actually, so um, I, I used to help demo these at the trade shows, and it's actually more comfortable because you actually lean, end up leaning on it. It feels like you're leaning on like a, up you against a stool or a bar. Like a recliner. Yeah. <laughs> Put it in lock mode and lean up against a tree, you'll be fine. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, you said that you have fixed displacement pumps, but you also said they're not variable speed. So Oh, they're variable speed. Sorry, not variable displacement. Fixed okay. displacement pump. But we can control it, can continuously vary with the speed based on that. We're, we're directly controlling the prime mover. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, how much do you worry about getting pinched? Uh, when I have my hands here, I think about it, but it's never happened. So uh -huh. I, because I'm thinking about it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I try to stay away from Yeah, I see your hands joints. near the joints. And yeah. I wonder. Yeah. I mean, this we is here to protect you. Oh, yeah, that, oh, there's so a little cover if there. If I were to stick my fingers in there and bend over, I'd have a problem. So it's got an interesting four bar linkage in there that would scissor off some digits if you ever got them in there. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to be able to count to nine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you have any, like, competitors? Uh, we do. So uh, early on when we were DARPA um, at UC Berkeley, our main competitor was Sarcos, a company called Sarcos that makes... Um, a, they made a more of a bleak styled exoskeleton with big arms. Um, unfortunately, they had the same power problems that we had with bleaks, and it was always tethered, and they were never able to untether it. They, they tried to reduce the, the power consumption in the servo valves, but that's a hard thing to do. They actually just released a new product that's out there. Um, they partnered up with Sarco, or Sarcos was purchased by Raytheon, and they partnered with Ditchwitch. They mounted their arms. It's, it's a neat device if you guys want to look it up. It's a, it's a set of arms mounted to a tract, uh, tractor, and so there's an individual standing there with the haptic feedback, and then he's got bigger arms mounted to the front where he can pick up something like a steel plate and get that feedback. So they've, um, they've eliminated the walking aspects of the robot and the power supply issues by doing that. the hand of man? The what? The hand of man? No. Burning man? Uh-uh. They have this big, like, 10-foot-wide hand that reaches down and picks up cars and and you can oh. operate it from like a cockpit oh, with, with, a, with a uh, so it sounds similar logo. to that. Yeah. 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 Um, but that's that's it. there's a, there's exos in general. There's probably I don't know five or five or ten companies working on it. Most of the universities um, around the country, around the world, working on exos. Let's just do a few more questions because you know, we're going to keep you here all night. Sorry. Uh, go ahead. When you talked about being 9% less effort, uh -huh. is that if he was using an XO with 200 pound load, it's 9% less than if he were un XO'd and no load? Right. It's an it's an okay. AB comparison with or without okay. XO. Oh, it's with load. It's with load. Both times. XO with time. load? Both oh, times. Both it's time. loaded, load. Oh. loaded versus okay. loaded. Yeah. So um, if you look at some of the papers that are working, they say 50% of the work is uh, goes into managing balance, and the other 50% of the work goes into um, uh, actually supporting the load, right? Okay. So with the XO, we can really attack that 50% that goes into supporting the load. Now we add overhead because we add mass and inertia and an exoskeleton to the individual. So we're really fighting against that is how you can make that. So the, the real way to attack it is make everything as light as possible. Uh, are you working on like carbon compass of fibers, titanium bars and things like that? Yeah, this one's like actually all cast titanium. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we're looking at ways to make it lighter and more robust. Yeah. Uh, have you ever done a head fire? So I was telling the story to these guys earlier. Um, early on, right before we were going to a demo, I was running down a hall in UC Berkeley, and early on we would just put a weight plate on the back of the devices, and we would slide plates on. So we'd slide on 50-pound plates, and I had 150 pounds on them. Was seeing how fast it would go, and it was actually an exo hiker. So it didn't have the power. And I was running down the hall, and I caught my foot. And you know that feeling where you catch your foot and you're trying to catch yourself? And you're still running, but you're trying to get your foot underneath you? Well, I didn't get my feet underneath me. And I eventually spun, landed on the floor, and slid across my back and put a furrow down the hallway <laughs> nice. on the weight post. I was fine, but all the doors in the hallway uh, slammed open to see what had happened. <laughs> well, that would be the way, is, is that so that you don't yeah. wind up... Yeah, I mean, you have the same problem without the XO. If you're carrying 200 pounds and you fall, you don't want to catch yourself. But uh, flash forward to last year, I was doing a demo out at uh, Fort Benning, 
in front of a bunch of special forces guys had this I was running across a field had the same thing where I caught my foot but luckily with the hip power I was able to recover and keep running so that actually for them was like wow he recovered they all thought I was going to eat it it's like big dog <laughs> <laughs> you know what you like. mm, these, these last two questions and then okay go ahead have you been in discussions with any groups that are um, designing types of space suits for future missions like Mars and beyond um, we've taught, yeah, Mars is going to be important, right, because you don't, it's, it's the gravity is higher than the moon, so you're going to need something to support exos. We have talked with, um, NASA indirectly about working on, on exoskeletons, but they're, right now they're more interested in exosizers, I would call them. Um, so basically we've spent all this time figuring out how to cancel gravity and they want to simulate gravity with an exo <laughs> to keep you from, from the bone density up, basically. All right. So the last question. Uh, how do you Yes, we actually have, um, and we're working on a DARP program now to figure out how to efficiently use nanomaterials for exostructures. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm sure there's more questions. Going into random access mode where we just you know uh, we'll walk around and talk. And I, I think we can let Sam out of the uh, suit if he wants to get out. Thank you so much. That was really good. Thank you for the rest of this.